Welcome to your new video in my How to Fly series. In this series I explain how to operate and how to fight an aircraft of the IL-2 Great Battle series. And today we take a look at the BF-109 G14. Finally! For the last couple of versions of the BF-109 I uploaded some brief model change notifications where I went into detail what the differences were to the predecessor models. In this video I will go into more detail again, as I think it's good to have a little refresher. Also, the original BF-09 F4 video is quite old by now, still valid I think, but a lot has changed. G model, flight models, damage model, and I think it's really time for a refresher here. I still can recommend to watch the MCN on the G6, but it's not mandatory this time. I will split the tutorial on the G14 in three parts. First the technical aspects of the aircraft like engine management, fuel consumption and differences to the G6. And the second part will be about the basics like cockpit layout, taxiing and landing. And the last part will be all about fighting and stuff. It will be fun. But now let's get cracking with the flight behavior and technical details of the G14. BF-09s in general are single-engined, single-seat, light, small, fast-climbing fighter aircraft with very good guns. And the sub-variant G14 is no exception here. Generally speaking, the G14 outclimbs most of its adversaries and is at least as maneuverable in close-quarter dogfights. The aircraft is handling very well from low to higher speeds. However, suffers a lot in new stall conditions and locks up on all axes at very high speeds, making power dive attacks or high speed evasions quite hard. But at the large variety of speeds, the G14 is very nimble, easy to fly and a joy to fight in. Noteworthy is that most BF lines need quite a bit of rudder deflection to fly coordinated, meaning that at high and low speeds the aircraft is yawing quite intensely, in a climb to the left and in a fast dive to the right. If that goes uncorrected, it causes a lot of drag. BF lands have flaps, which can be deployed gradually, but only very slowly. So extending them and retracting them needs quite a bit of time, which can be a hassle in a fight where you have to drop your flaps quickly. The BF-9 has only a pitch trim, ailerons and the rudder can't be trimmed in flight. Historically, the ground crew trimmed those pre-flight by moving those red trim tabs on the control surfaces. Sadly, this isn't possible in our sim. All BF-9s in the sim are trimmed out for level crews. However, the pitch trim on the 19 is highly effective and much better than systems of the Allied aircraft, since the entire horizontal stabilizer is moving, giving you much more control. Hence why this form of trim is also called stabilizer trim. Trim is used for a couple of purposes. As the airspeed changes, the generated lift across the aircraft changes to different extents. So in a dive, in a fast cruise, the pilot needs to push the stick forward constantly to counteract the increasing lift from the wings. Or in a slow climb, the pilot has to pull the stick a bit to stay in the climb. So you can use the trim either to stay level, to pull out of a dive, to enter a climb, or to force your aircraft into a dive without working yourself up. The stabilizer setting on the run can't be changed very suddenly. You have to think about your stabilizer setting before a dive or fight. Otherwise you either can't pull out of a dive or you can't turn properly. Flying the wheel from 9 also means managing the stabilizer to some extent. I say it's a stabilizer where even yeah, kinda experienced pilots lose a lot of performance. With a full tail heavy trim you can't achieve top speeds, then that setting creates some drag and with a nose heavy trim you achieve top speed but you can't turn anymore since the pilot lacks the stick authority. So this all is something the pilot needs to be aware of. The BF-109 G6 suffered a lot from increased weight and a less aerodynamic airframe compared to older 109 models, causing more and more drag while the engine was not changed at all, resulting that the aircraft got slower while the opposition got faster and more maneuverable. The G14 has now a tool to compensate for that drag and that is MW50 injection, boosting the engine power on lower altitudes quite considerably. MW50 stands for Methanol und Wasser, Methanol and Water in a 1 to 1 ratio, approximately. There's a small anti-corrosion component in there, but it's basically 1 to 1. 
This liquid gets sprayed into the supercharger and leads to a higher knock resistance and some cooling effects. I'm not going into that much detail here. The YouTube channel Greg's Airplanes and Automobiles did a great job and a good video on the system. I will link that video in the description and as a card on screen right now in the eye on the top right corner. But as a result the BF109 can run now with much higher throttle settings for a longer time, improving the power to weight ratio of the aircraft massively in combat situations. The MW50 injection gets active when the pilot applies full throttle. This triggers the injection and is raising the manifold pressure to 1.8 atar. As a reminder the G6 could hold full power for one minute, the G14 can now hold full power, much higher power, for 10 minutes. That means that the aircraft can keep and regain energy much quicker than the original G6. The G14 has the supply of water methanol for about 28 minutes total. It's really hard to run out, since you only have fuel for one hour maximum. Actually I never ran out, so I don't know, I think that's really enough for any circumstances. I mean, maybe someday we get, then there might be the theoretical possibility to run out of MW50. The system loses its benefits the higher you go. Until, at roughly 7 km of altitude, the G14 has no speed advantages anymore over the G6. The G14 got a new canopy, the so-called Erla Haube, which allows for a much clearer view through the sides and to the rear. Very neat. Other than that, the G14 is pretty much a G6 with MW50. The climb rates, the top speeds are almost identical with the G14 when the G14 is flown only in Comet power at 1.3 ATAR. You are still around. This is really great. If you liked this video so far, consider your support on Patreon. Doing these videos takes time, effort and a lot of thought. And if you enjoy this, why not give a dollar or two? You get some perks of being a patron on my channel. You get a couple of hours of early access when new videos are ready to be uploaded and to be released. Uh, monthly I do a tech view, flight review of one of my gameplays uploaded uh, from the engineers tier and higher. So take a look at the Patreon page, don't feel obliged or something like this, just take a look and if you consider a pledge that would be great. But as always, my content stays free forever. Many thanks. The bf engine management is very easy, because everything is just automated. The pilot sets up the desired throttle and the aircraft systems do the rest. The aircraft systems set a mixture, RPM and open and close the oil and water radiators automatically. The supercharger is run with fluid coupling, which also means that the supercharger is automated. However, the aircraft has more quirks than the average pilot really knows, and that's what we are going to talk about now. The engine's boost is measured in German planes with ATA, A -T -A, which is by today's standards an outdated unit for technical atmospheric pressure. So to run the engine at 1.0 ATA means that the engine is fed with air equally dense as the standard atmosphere at sea level. Higher means the air is more compressed and lower means that the intake's air pressure is below atmospheric pressure. Again, to go into detail here would require way too much time, so if you are interested in the precise technical background of this, I highly recommend to look into that topic yourself. The engine of the B409 G14 can, can be run in three basic regimes. First, from no throttle to 1.15 ATAR is called continuous or economy mode, which is often set up for cruise or a very slow climb. Then, from 1.15 to 1.3 ATAR, you are in climb or combat mode. With that, the RPM is increasing to a maximum of 2600 RPM as well. The engine can sustain this mode for 30 minutes at a time and gives you a nice climb rate to get to altitude to keep a nice calm combat speed. But to be honest, this is by no means powerful enough to deal with enemies in 1944 or 45. Hence why 
If you really have to fight, you most likely use emergency power at 1.7 ATAR, giving you all the power the aircraft has to offer with MW50 injection and 2800 RPM. This setting can be held for 10 minutes at a time and needs a rest at a 1 to 1 ratio. Means, if you used emergency power for 10 minutes, you'd need to fly for 10 minutes at combat or continuous power to be able to use full power again. It's important to understand that the engine, in order to sustain that much load for 10 minutes, it needs MW50. So if you want power, use full power, since only with the throttle lever full forward the MW50 is feeding. If your throttle is just above combat power, your engine runs at too high settings without injection. Again, your aircraft has supply for roughly 28 minutes of injection, meaning that you run out of fuel before you used up the water methanol. You can check if the MW is feeding by checking the gauge in the left side of the cockpit. Never use full power right away at takeoff since you run the danger of over revving the engine. The propeller pitch governor is not fast enough for that. While the 109 can and should be flown with full automation, there are situations where it can make sense to switch the automation off. A system I switch off regularly is the propeller pitch governor. The propeller pitch governor is a device which regulates the propeller pitch to reach the desired RPM. For that purpose, the clock-like indicator in the cockpit is handy and at 12 o'clock and beyond, the pitch of the propellers is pretty fine, meaning that the propellers are set up for maximum acceleration. They are also producing a lot of drag in that setup when the aircraft speed is increasing. This can be exploited in the right conditions. For example, in a descent towards your airfield, you can set up a fine pitch to slow your aircraft down or at least prevent the aircraft from getting faster. In the landing process, in your final, you get a more immediate response from the throttle input and more control over your descent. A fine pitch will lead to high RPM. Coarse pitch is good when you need the best aerodynamics since the blades are moving out of the slipstream, creating less drag but are unable to generate a lot of thrust. So a coarse pitch will lead to lower RPM and slower climbs and slower acceleration. Experienced pilots use a coarse pitch mostly in situations where quick accelerations are not needed or not possible. For example, in a glide with a dead engine or in extreme economy mode. For example, when your engine is hit, it makes sense to put the throttle to roughly 1.0 ATAR and set up an RPM of 1700 RPM to preserve the engine. I point out again that the engine will set up a fine or coarse pitch on its own and does that very well, but shutting the automation off can be beneficial when decoupling RPM and throttle leads to a better fuel economy, longer engine life or just to have more control over your aircraft. You can also disable the water radiator automation, which I rarely do, but closing the radiators can gain you some speed at the expense of boiling coolant. Maybe something worth it when the alternative is death by Spitfire. Even when you are not planning to use the manual control, learning about it helps to understand the aircraft. All things considered, the 109 is not a plane which consumes a lot of fuel. A pretty standard 1.2 ATAR cruise, the aircraft consumes roughly 6 liters of fuel per minute, giving you just above 1 hour of flight time. At full power, the aircraft consumes a little more than 10 liters per minute. So effectively, with some climbing, some combat and a little cruise, you will end up with sorties between uh, 45 and 60 minutes on your 400 liter fuel tank. The reserve lamp gets lit in your cockpit with 80 liters or less, which means that you have less than 8 minutes on full power, a little less than 12 minutes on combat power and a range of 70 and 95 kilometers respectively. If you want to save fuel, you need to throttle down to 1.0 ATAR and below. At 1.0 ATAR, your consumption drops to 4.6 liters a minute, giving you a range of 120 kilometers on the reserve. At 0.8 ATAR, you can extend that range to 150 kilometers at a consumption of 3.4 liters per minute. I'm sure you can maximize that even more, but that is usually not really something you do in this sim. I think with manual prop pitch and 1500 RPM and 0.7 ATI, you can expect a little less than 2.5 liters per minute. I haven't tested that. 
Usually I fly on cruise to get from A to B, I fly on combat power in the hot zone, emergency power when I really need it, and on the return trip I cut my throttle to 1.2 or even below that when needed. The BFL9 G14 has a few loadout options. The first one is the MK108, which swaps out the MG151 20mm cannon for a way more powerful 30mm cannon. I always do that. While the 30mm shells are way slower and are generally speaking harder to aim, it's no factor for most of my kills. With a bit of trigger discipline you can easily shoot on plenty of aircraft before the ammo runs out. You have 65 shells. And most fighters only need one good hit, three at the most. Highly recommended. The next option are the gun pods, adding two more 20mm cannons under the wings. What can I say? I can't stand them. While they add a lot more firepower, this is mostly not needed and hampers maneuverability, climb rate and acceleration quite a lot, adding over 200 kilograms of weight. This is a big nope for me, the aircraft becomes very sluggish when installing those, nothing for me I have to say. But I know some, some people fly with them very successfully, but uh, with a 30mm cannon and the 13mm on the nose of the aircraft I see no real need. Quickly uh, skip the bombs here. They are bombs, so nothing special here. I rarely fly the 109 with bombs. When I go ground attacking, I pick other aircraft like uh, the BF 110, or in the future, uh, the ME 410, or of course the Focke-Wulf 190, which is much more suited for the role. In the end, bombs are bombs. So uh, if you like to ground attack, have your pick. At least the interesting pick would be the Berfa Granate 21, which is a 21cm rocket launcher. And it's called that way because it wears Granate, of course. It consists basically of two disposable tubes below the wings with two rockets. After firing, they explode after a set time, creating a huge blast, meant to bring down large bomber formations where accuracy is not really an issue. We have no large bomber formations in the game yet, making this loadout option rather useless and has maybe only some meme qualities. Lastly, we have in the loadout uh, options the radio beacon compass, which is neat. Shows you in the cockpit the direction to the closest radio beacon, which is often installed next to your home fields. Sadly, this particular version of the compass adds quite a bit of weight, 20 kilograms extra, and quite a big antenna on top of the aircraft, creating some drag. I personally know the maps by now, so this is not super useful to me. However, this option will help many pilots who don't know the maps, which is a large proportion, I guess. But this is it. In the next part we will talk about uh, how to get the aircraft going, how the cockpit is layouted, where you find all the gauges and stuff, how to taxi the aircraft, how to take off and how to land. I guess that is very important as well, right? So. I hope I see you in the next one.